Good morning, everyone. I'm the Reverend Linda Sutherland, Minister at First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Northboro, Massachusetts. And this is um, our next to the last Circle Sunday for this summer, where congregations from quite an area around us gather together and share in summer worship. Um, I would ask that if you're if you're able to manage the technology that you put your name on your zoom picture. And <clears throat> please feel free during the service to send love and comfort to say yes I love it yay to say oh I agree with that. It just helps us feel like we're not alone. And so we will open our service this morning with a chalice lighting. If you have a chalice to light at home, you're invited to join me in lighting a chalice. We kindle a flame we trust will lead us forward as we travel in unknown lands where the question, shall I ever get there, resounds a clear, pure note in every silence. The womb of stars embraces us, remnants of their fiery furnaces pulse through our veins. We are of the stars, the dust of explosions cast across space. Dare to dance with dreamers, sing their song. Dare to dance their stories, sing out strong. Dare to dance with freedom your whole life long. Dare to dance again. We are of the earth. We breathe and live and dance in the breath of ancient plants and beasts. Lift up your heads to meet the day. Ready yourselves for new life. Even when rain sets in, open those umbrellas of gratitude and set out anyway. Dare to dance with dreamers sing their song, dare to dance their stories, sing out strong, dare to dance with freedom your whole life long, dare to dance again. Dance the dance of springtime, for we are called to dance again. That was recorded last spring, and it occurred to me this morning that we're pretty much in the same situation we were last spring. We're still wondering if it's safe to go out. So I have a reading called Emergence by Kimberly Ann Tomzak Carlson. She quotes Ursula Goodenough. Good enough, good now? I don't know how to say her name. As the scientist and religious naturalist who says tales of natural emergence are far more magical than traditional miracles. Emergent is, emergence is inherent in everything that is alive, allowing our yearning for supernatural miracles to be subsumed by our joy in the countless miracles that surround us. She's, the author says, the words witness butterfly metamorphosis at home leapt off the educational catalog 
into my imagination this past April. We had begun homeschooling and I impulsively decided we should get a butterfly garden. It was the end of a long winter. Our house felt small as three of us occupied the space 24 hours a day. My partner was not thrilled about adding caterpillars to our household. You want to raise insects? I replied that it would be educational and there would be butterflies. I wanted to watch something grow, become something new, and then be joyfully released. I needed a reminder of predictable life cycles. I was convinced my child needed this too. One of the great joys of having children in your life is witnessing them explore their intention of becoming. The world is wide open to them and everything is possible. As we get older, our unfolding is not always visible or recognized. Perhaps becoming is just more internal during adulthood. Anyway, how hard would it be to raise butterflies? Each night we would place the butterfly garden angled just so in the window to catch the morning light. It turned out that becoming a butterfly requires sunlight. We did this to get to witness metamorphosis at home. Sometimes it was really gross. Chrysalis can be gooey. Once it was almost tragic as the cat's fascination took flight and the chrysalis got knocked around. The experience was filled with unexpected drama and fear of failure, yet ultimately magical and absolutely worth it. The daily shared experience of observing the transformation was salve for our nature-loving souls. Each chrysalis that hatched felt like a miracle. Emergence, becoming, is inherent in each of us. Often, we forget how miraculous we are. The sheer improbability of our existence escapes us, and we need butterfly garden-shaped reminders. Thank goodness there are small miracles surrounding us. One of those small miracles happens every week when congregations of many faith traditions pause and focus together on those things of most worth, which is, by the way, the origin of the word worship. Many of these congregations lift up in lift up heartfelt support and blessings for each other and for people everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who has shared this morning. And I invite us all to hold a moment of silence for what has been shared here and for all of the lives that are being lost in this pandemic. And thankful for the blessing of being together in community. Let's sing together, draw the circle wide. I came across a reading the other day called Controlling Chaos 
by the Reverend Barbara Merritt. And I'd like to share that with you. She says, my husband, the physics teacher receives a weekly magazine called Science News. A recent cover story in bold letters riveted my attention and snatched it, controlling chaos. Now, that's a practical theology. My hopes soared. Here in concise scientific prose was the potential solution to my checkbook, my desk, my attic, my basement, my schedule, and possibly the junk drawer in the kitchen. I took notes as I eagerly read the text. It said, just as small disturbances can radically alter a chaotic system's behavior, have the author's children also been sick? Tiny adjustments can also stabilize its behavior. Tiny adjustments? Why, why didn't I think of that? What tiny adjustments? I read further. The success of this strategy for controlling chaos hinges on the fact that the apparent randomness of a chaotic system is really only skin deep. Is the scientific community sure about this? Have they ever seen my desk or the toy room? Beneath the chaotic unpredictability hides an intricate but highly ordered structure. This is not obvious in, to the casual observer of my life. This is akin to balancing a ball on a, on a saddle. The ball won't roll off the saddle's raised front and back, but continued adjustments are needed to kick it back into position as it begins rolling off the sides. Continual adjustments. Now I'm beginning to think scientifically. What continual adjustments? We didn't avoid chaos. We, we don't avoid the chaos. We stay in the chaotic region. Yes, I do that. You don't need to have a deep theoretical understanding of what's going on. All you need to know, in effect, is the shape of the saddle. Shape. All I need to understand is the shape of my chaos. What shape? And then Eureka, the author writes that the way to keep chaos under control is by a constant stream of nudges. Aha, uh -huh. I now have scientific proof that my intuitive reaction to chaos works. Nudge it, don't disturb it or organize it, nudge it. The article had a very upbeat ending. It claims that chaos is not something to be avoided due to the flexible and dynamic nature of chaos. Chaos may offer a great advantage. Well, I breathlessly await further scientific breakthroughs in this area. Meanwhile, I'll go nudge a few papers off my desk. Well, here we are folks in this metamorphosis moment. We thought that like the butterfly emerging from the chrysalis, we could start spreading our wings, maybe even before long, feel the freedom of flight. And here we are back in uncertainty, back in the gooey moment, surrounded by uncertainty, filled with uncertainty, embodying uncertainty. <sighs> We're getting used to this. We are getting tired of this. And yet in nature, dissolving into goo has a purpose. It's a tried and true way to completely transform a caterpillar fit only for eating, 
into a beautiful creature capable of flight and able to lay eggs on plants that will nourish a new generation. Now, without taking this metaphor too far, let's review the process of metamorphosis. And there you have it, in a minute and a half, how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. What lessons can we learn from this? Perhaps like the caterpillar, we already know instinctively what to do. In fact, we've been doing it. Faced with chaos, we found our own best places and routines spaces of relative safety in which to withdraw when we are weary. And we've all been weary. No longer to, able to meet in person, we shred, we shed our former selves and what it meant to be church. We've turned into goo individually <laughs> and as congregations. Sometimes, honestly, I've almost had a physical sensation of having turned to goo. Forgetful, indecisive, in a fog, not sure what to do next. But could it be that this gooey state is not a sign of breakdown, but rather a process that will allow us to emerge as ourselves, but radically changed? Could this be our metamorphosis moment? In an interview with On Being's Krista Tippett, the Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams reflected, there is something dying in our society, in our culture, and there's something dying in us individually. And what's dying is the willingness to be in denial. And that is extraordinary. The willingness to be in denial is dying in a meaningful number of us. Maybe the tipping point. It's always been happening. And when it happens in enough of us, in a short enough period of time, at the same time, then you have a tipping point and the culture begins to shift. And then what I feel like people are at now is, no, no, bring it on. We have to face it. We have to face it. And yes, indeed, face it again, apparently. Because as COVID numbers rapidly rise yet again with the school year just starting, many of us may feel, many of you may feel like I do, back in the goo again. But the goo is not the whole story because one amazing thing about metamorphosis is that that film clip didn't even mention that no matter how gooey it gets, we always have imaginal disks. Now, when I typed that, my computer 
wanted to change that to imaginary, but no, imaginal is correct. This is from the Scientific American. The article says, the contents of the pupa, oh, let's, let me start at the beginning here. First, the caterpillar digests itself, releasing enzymes to dissolve all of its tissues. If you were to cut open a cocoon or chrysalis at just the right time, caterpillar soup would ooze out. There's the goo. But the contents of the pupa are not entirely an amorphous mess. Certainly, high, certain highly organized groups of cells known as imaginal discs survive the digestive process. Before hatching, when a caterpillar is still developing inside its egg, it grows an imaginal disc for each of the adult body parts it will need as a mature butterfly or moth. Discs for its eyes, for its wings, for its legs, and so on. In some species, these imaginal discs remain dormant throughout the caterpillar's life. And in other species, the discs begin to take the shape of adult body parts even before the caterpillar forms a chrysalis or cocoon. Some caterpillars walk around with tiny rudimentary wings tucked inside their bodies, though you would never know it by looking at them. Imagine that, imaginal discs, something tiny already residing within and among us that can guide us step-by-step step through this transformation time into whatever it is that we need to be transformed into. What are these imaginal discs? Perhaps we've already had glimpses of some of them in moments when we took a risk and did things a little differently. Moments when we found our voice and chose to be brave. Moments when we laid down our fear and walked right into it. Moments when we began to look with new eyes. Moments when cruelty taught us something. Moments when we just let go and had fun. Moments when we were astonished by gratuitous compassion and knew that it was a miracle of healing. What if those moments contain imaginal discs for our future? A future of more truth telling, more compassion, more respect for others and the earth, more gratitude, more willingness to learn and grow and experiment and share and rejoice together. A future that, frankly, we as yet only have brief glimpses of. Imaginal discs only give us hints of what is possible while we are still in the goo. So what do we do right now? Buddhist teachings on non-attachment come to mind. Practitioners are encouraged to let go of a certain outcome, even to let go of knowing what outcomes are possible. Perhaps the best thing we can do is to let go of wishing things were different. I'm even trying to let go of wishing I knew what the bleep is going to be going on next week and how that might affect worship. Give up the fight. Stop feeling we have to keep forging a path through quicksand. Let the goo cradle us and let it begin to coalesce on its own volition around those imaginal discs that are there whether we can see them or not. Let go and stop feeling we have to have some other life than here and now. Give up the longing for some other world and just breathe. Give up the fight for some other moment, some other life than here. I'm just gonna breathe 
give up the longing for some other world, the wishing yeah, for no other choices to make, other songs to sing, other I'm bodies, other ages, other countries, other stakes. Till I touch the sorrow neath the rage I'm just gonna breathe Purge the past Forgive the future For each comes too soon Surrender only to this I'm life This one This moment here and now Surrender only to this day, to this hour, this breath. Not because it does not Give constantly break your heart, but because Some it too beckons with beauty, startles with delight. If only we can keep waking Give up to this gift, Some this is the gift we have been given. These, these body clothes, this heartbreak, it's ours. This pulse, it's ours. This breath, this light, these friends, this hope. All we can do is remember ourselves here. I'm just gonna breathe all all a part of it all still growing together I'm just gonna breathe until I'm glad to breathe here for a while we'll give up the some other love Just hope in the way that you are living you Give up the fight For some other love Just changing, no longer resisting Come on and breathe, breathe, breathe Come on and breathe, breathe Give up the fight, breathe, breathe. Some other life, breathe, breathe. Give up the fight, breathe, breathe. Some other life, breathe, breathe. I'm just gonna breathe. And now, before we close, I'd like to remind everyone to please give generously as you are able to support UU ministry and work in the world. You're invited to think about donating what you can to your congregation or to the wider UU world. And donations to First Parish Northboro can be made by check or PayPal using information in the chat. After the benediction and postlude, we will open the floor for some announcements. And then we will be invited to our virtual coffee hour for those who would like to stay. So I leave you with this. We extinguish our chalice flame and trust that the light kindled within us will lead us forward as we travel in unknown paths, where the question, shall we ever get there, resounds a clear, pure note in every silence. We are going. But we know within, and we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there.
there, but we know we will. It will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Why are ya? Why are ya? Why are ya? Why are ya? We are going. Heaven knows where we are going, but we know we live. And we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Why are ya? Why are ya? Why are ya? Why are ya? Why are ya?